Okay. Um, if anyone can't hear, just let me know. I'm going to try to stay as close to the mic as I can uh, during the presentation. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm Jen Robinson. Um, I work for Historic New England as our Preservation Services Manager for Southern New England. So this is my region. So I'm so pleased to see so many of you turn out tonight. And I think the city should have some strong wall super fans here. So thank you very much for coming. So before I really get into stone walls, I just wanted to give a little intro about who Historic New England is, if you're not familiar. Um, we are our region's largest and most comprehensive preservation organization. Um, and we save and share historic homes and landscapes. Uh, we have object and archival collections. And um, through our work, our goal is to really inspire preservation throughout uh, our region and beyond. Some of you might know us through our historic sites. We have 38. Um, closest to here is the Winslow Crocker House down in Sandwich, but in Metro Boston, we have the Eustis Estate in Milton, the Lyman Estate in Waltham. Um, we also have a collection of over 110,000 objects up in April, which is getting a huge overhaul, so stay tuned on that for public access. Um, we also house an archive of over a million uh, paper records. And uh, within Historic New England, um, I work on the preservation services team, so our uh, sort of purview is fourfold. Um, I primarily work with our easement program, uh, which protects over 125 and counting privately owned properties uh, throughout New England through preservation restrictions. So that's how I end up in the South Shore, because there's about 40 down here. So that brings me to this area quite frequently. Um, we also share a lot of technical guidance um, through our membership program to homeowners and other uh, interested folks, people interested in historic buildings and architecture. Uh, we're an advocate throughout our region for specific projects that may be happening. Uh, and we also provide lots of educational programs like the one you're uh, seeing here tonight. We offer field schools and now we have an annual summit, um, which this year will be in Maine, but last year was in Providence. So stay tuned for that. It's in the fall. So here's kind of an outline of what we'll be looking at tonight. Um, and I'd like to start by thinking that uh, it's sort of easy to think of a stone wall. It's just a pile of rocks. Uh, maybe it's a carefully stacked pile of rocks. But how complicated is it actually to build a stone wall? Some of you might actually know that answer if you're a, if you're a mason or a grass person. Um, but why are the stone walls in particular so closely associated with New England? So we're going to delve into uh, some of those considerations tonight, as well as tackling uh, stonewall preservation and maintenance. So I'm going to start giving kind of a historic overview of stone walls and context, um, which I'll follow with what are the actual legal protections. This is a question I get a lot, how do we protect stone walls? And finally, I'll go over uh, how they're built and how they can be So this is one of my favorite photos in the presentation. Um, this is Block Island uh, in Rhode Island. I'm a native Rhode Island person, maybe that's why. Um, in the early 20th century. And I chose this picture because I feel like it shows the vastness of what we're talking about uh, and the types of landscapes that stone walls inhabit in our region. Um, and when English colonists arrived in what we now know as, know as New England, they brought with them agricultural practices, which were radically different from the indigenous people that lived in these, uh, this area. And that permanently changed the landscape. So we have to think of stone walls in that context. Um, and today we see evidence of these changes through the thousands of miles of stone walls that thread through uh, New England. Uh, we see them bordering our roads and defining our fields. Um, there are containing walls, double walls, single walls, some of which I'll go over a little later. Um, and each is really an enduring uh, representation of where and when and why they were constructed. And we see, of course, uh, local variations. I was just talking to someone earlier about that uh, based on geology, which changes the size of the walls, how they're constructed, um, their heights and their color. And while some walls were finally built for public display, 
uh, others were really intended simply as fences for livestock or simply as piles to get excess stone out of the way. So there's a wide variety here. Another great slide. <laughs> this was taken in Martha's Vineyard. Um, and this is just a staggering statistic. This is um, data collected by a mining engineer whose name was Oliver Bowles in 1939. And he estimated that there were approximately 240,000 miles of stone walls in England. And he used an 1872 report that was uh, uh, collected by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to find this data. But um, he was looking at their report on fences, which you'll see that's another almost like a synonym for walls during this time. And this measurement is essentially a distance that's further from the distance to the moon or the length of the US, state, uh, US coastline. So that's just a staggering number of walls. So why exactly are stone walls so prolific in our area? The first of these you might be familiar with, you might be familiar with from your, your high school uh, geology class. Uh, we often hear that the abundance of stone uh, is one of the reasons, and this is certainly true. Uh, there was a glacier that covered New England, and the trail of stone that it left behind is what gave us the, the material to build our walls. Um, but it's a little more nuanced than just that. Um, the shaded area that you see, the white area, uh, represents the Laurentide Ice Sheet. So this reached its maximum size about 115,000 to 25,000 years ago, so long time ago. Uh, it includes not only New England, but you can see it also includes portions of the Midwest and what is now northern U.S. <coughs> so why don't those other areas have prolific stone walls like we do? And the answer to that is because of our unique geology. So the types of stone that we find in uh, New England typically are very hard. Uh, such as granite. And um, as those glaciers formed and they advanced and retreated, their immense weight started ripping back up the land. And the only stones that survived were the ones that were hard. So in our case, that includes granite and other hard types of stone. Granite is indicated in uh, red in this map, so you can see how extensive it is. Um, in contrast, areas in the Midwest, the bedrock is typically softer stone, so stone like limestone, which is why you see fewer walls out, out, uh, out there. And I also showed on the right-hand side just the sheer variety, even though we have some similar geology throughout New England, the walls that you see and the more you look around um, are very different. The top photo I took in Westport, uh, the middle photo I took in Waltham, and the bottom photo the thin slabby stone I took in Middletown, Rhode Island. So even within that small area, there's a, a wide variety of stone. This is another striking uh, image. The third factor that resulted in our high density of stone walls in New England was deforestation. So this was the result of land clearance for agriculture purposes. I was also talking with someone earlier about this. Um, and in these images, we can see how different the landscape would have looked in situ uh, in other coastal communities um, by the height of forest clearing in the 19th century, which is the image on the right. Um, now that pendulum has swung backwards, a lot of the walls we see are in woodlands, but those woodlands would have been open agricultural fields. Uh, in the 18th century, 19th century. So let's take a closer look at changes in the soil layers because of this deforestation, because of changing the land to, to agricultural use. Um, and the images you see here are just kind of a cross section what the soil looked like before and after deforestation. Um, and first you'll note the thickness of the topsoil before the land was cleared, which is the diagram at the left. And one of the effects of deforestation is soil erosion, because trees help the land to uh, retain its uh, water and topsoil. So without forest, that soil then erodes and washes away. 
So the erosion of the topsoil exposed New England subsoil to the cold, causing a deeper freeze of groundwater and what is called frost heat, which is what you can see here, right? So when a frost heat happens, it starts to push stones to the surface. Um, and I'll show you here before and after. So each spring, and a lot of people are familiar with this idea, there'd be a new frost heat kind of uh, bringing forth new stones to the surface, which then had to be removed from the field. So it's a very rocky and um, area and hard work. The most prolific period of building in our region um, appears to have occurred in the mid to late 1700s. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why later. Now, before um, I move forward in time, I wanted to uh, kind of touch upon what types of indigenous stone structures may, you may encounter um, as you research walls in your area. And um, it's important to remember that uh, the indigenous uh, peoples who inhabited the Northeast also often used uh, stone in building, albeit for many different purposes. Um, for many people and tribes, uh, stone formations, other kinds of stone structures uh, have a particular spiritual significance um, that's tied to the land. And um, my own personal experience, I was just at a site uh, out in the Blackstone Valley that has an overlap of colonial stone walls and then stone <coughs> structures that have been identified as having spiritual significance. So my point is that it's very possible that you may encounter these kind of overlaps in your own research, in your own local communities. Um, and there is uh, an indigenous knowledge of these stone sites that gets passed down from generation to generation. Um, and I've included the image from the Narragansett on the right-hand side because, in fact, they still maintain a stone wall building tradition uh, to this day. There's a great documentary called Stone on Stone, and you can probably get it from the library, that talks about this very, uh, uh, that they have continued on this tradition uh, into the present day. So very fascinating topic. So as I was mentioning, the height of stone wall construction uh, during colonial settlement began in the mid to late 1700s. So before this time, wood was very plentiful. It was one of the first things the colonial settlers noticed when they came to New England. Um, so the earliest enclosures, you're probably familiar with the picture at the bottom right at Plymouth, those early uh, enclosures were most likely made of wood. Uh, and settlers coming from England were imposing ideas of land use that they had developed over time, that they were familiar with from home. And this was related to varying degrees of land enclosure systems, these differed all across uh, the British Isles. But usually when land was enclosed in Britain, um, it was usually done with stone or hedgerows, not, um, as wood was scarce uh, there. So a lot of that stone wall building tradition is already developed when people are arriving. So when uh, the settlers first encountered uh, the many coastal tribes in the Northeast here, they were already engaged in agriculture. Um, they were still maintaining traditional hunting and fishing practices, but also had developed their own agriculture. And so many had seasonal villages with planting sites that often have multiple crops going on at the same time. And that's what you see in the image at the left. Um, if you've ever heard of a three sisters type garden where all the plants kind of mutually help one another to grow, this is the type of mixed uh, uh, planting that was going on. But when the settlers arrived, they saw this as a little bit chaotic. Um, it wasn't really what they were used to. They were used to a, a monocultural kind of agriculture where different types of crops were separated and um, there was a planned nature to what was going on in terms of the land division. And they also interpreted dividing the land as an improvement on the land, which then justified um, them claiming the land as their own. So it's all part of uh, the context of where these walls and why they're being built. So after the Revolutionary War, uh, the colonists were confronted with a wood shortage. 
uh, they had used, they had cut, clear cut all, you know, huge swaths of uh, New England, and now there was a lot of stone rising to the surface at the same time. So after decades of that clearance, now it's time to build the walls, and that's why I mentioned um, kind of that post-world, uh, post-revolutionary war period is the period of uh, the most prolific stone wall building. And although walls were more time-consuming to construct, um, that abundance of stone was just a readily available material. But how exactly were those walls built? This is a question I get a lot, and some of those stones are absolutely enormous. Um, and those, the stone sizes can range, as you know, from small particles up to these huge boulders. So some stones were obviously large enough that one or two people could lift them. But when we're talking about bigger stones, oftentimes uh, farmers would use what's known as a skid. It looks like a sled, kind of in the top image that you can see there. Um, and that uh, allowed a stone to be loaded on to the skid and pulled by oxen. So the oxen are doing all the work. Uh, for stones that are too large to carry or move to the stone boat, the techniques kind of vary based, uh, depending on the time period. But one really interesting way that you can think about dating a wall is looking for these plug marks. You can see the different types of tools on the left-hand side that were used. In the 18th century, uh, the plugs were usually like a flat wedge. By the 1830s, it evolved, had evolved into a round wedge. So if you're looking at um, looking for those lines, usually in the top of the stone, that helps them to cut the stone, kind of hammer it down, and make a flat plane to try to insert the stone or fit it uh, where they needed it to go. Uh, they could also do this with ice, wait for ice to fill up those holes and break the stone apart naturally. So there are a couple of different ways they could go about breaking apart large pieces. So during early colonial America, uh, it's important to remember, like I was saying, that the land division was really also about keeping animals away from plants, uh, which is obvious because they're going to want to eat them. Um, and so with mixed fields side by side, um, you find that this results in a certain monitoring or a need for the government to monitor whether or not walls are doing their job. And if anyone who's looked through court records during this period probably knows the number of disputes between farmers and neighbors about whose animals are getting into what crops. And so uh, most towns had a fence viewer. They're called a fence viewer, so fence meaning walls. And this person would walk the walls to see that they were sturdy, that they were in the locations they were supposed to be. Um, they were kind of in charge of being an intermediary for these disputes. So the record you see, and there may be even some for situate as well, is from a fence viewer in um, the 19th century. I mean, this practice continued throughout the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, this one's from Greenwich, Mass, and it talks about stray beasts and lost goods. Um, and fence viewers might have used a tool called a gunter's chain, very specific. Um, the one at bottom right is actually in the Smithsonian. It's a tool that was used in British colonies to measure uh, the length of walls. So basically that whole uh, metal apparatus unfurls and it equals, uh, 100 links equals 66 feet. So that was the most popular way of uh, measuring the land. So some people might be wondering what happened when an animal has actually escaped. So most New England towns, and these are kind of an endangered species in and of themselves now, a town pound, um, was constructed to contain animals that had escaped, and their owner had to come and pay a fine to release them. So I included three pictures that a colleague had taken, but I was also excited to find that you all have a town pound that you protect at one of your historic sites here in Situate, so that made me really happy to see that it was uh, protected. Okay, so in this part of the presentation, I'm going to use some historic New England sites, some primary source research um, or resources to try to get you to think of ways that uh, you might be able to research uh, or access uh, information about stone walls in your own community. And the 
but first I'm going to do it kind of century by century, just one example per century. And the first one I'm going to show is in the 17th century. Um, I was mentioning earlier that Historic New England has 38 museum sites. One of those is in Waltham, which is where I work. And uh, we recently um, heard from the Waltham Historical Society. They've been doing some research on these huge walls. The walls are just made of huge boulders, basically, um, that are still kind of running through people's property lines of Waltham. And although I know <coughs> earlier the most prolific period for wall building was a post-revolutionary war, um, that doesn't mean walls weren't being built before then. If there was surface stone, it was used for many purposes, one of which was to divide the land. Um, and we found that this line of stones actually ties to the settling of Waltham and what's known as Waltham's Great Dividend Grants. So I'll show you the map. <coughs> So this is a 1738 map showing how the land in Waltham was originally divided. Here's a look at Waltham today, so they kind of did an overlay. Generally the same uh, shape, just a few tweaks to the border. And those dividend grants, uh, they were basically 120 lots for the freemen of Waltham at its founding. So they were founders, they were uh, accepted members of Waltham's church, uh, they were wealthy uh, landowners. And these lots in Waltham were divided into really thin strips, which were called squadrons. So those are considered squadrons. So what they did was they actually lined up the location of these walls and, li and lined it up with the map and discovered that those walls actually line up with the original squadron lines at Waltham, which is pretty interesting. And so this is one way, if you have local maps, period maps, you can try to start lining up and seeing where walls match the historical record. So for the 18th century, I included uh, one of my favorite sites um, that we own at KC Farm. It's located in southern Rhode Island. And um, another way to look at walls is really through the eyes of the people that built them, which can be difficult. It's hard to parse through the historic record to find stories of laborers and people who actually may have put these walls together. Um, but going through ledgers and diaries and other period documents can sometimes lead to really interesting discoveries. So we had a researcher looking through um, the family papers here at this farm. And they actually found the entries related to stone wall building. So um, they, the entries they found included descriptions of the types of walls that were being built, um, their lengths, but most importantly, they also included notes about who built them. We found out that there was a man named Caesar Northrup, who was a hired African-American farmhand who built some of the walls. Um, we found out that Reynold Knowles at who was a tenant farmer, built 900 feet of five-foot wall in exchange for 600 pounds of Narragansett cheese, which is surprising, but Narragansett cheese was a very uh, tradable commodity during that period. So uh, just a fascinating glimpse into what could often be an overlooked history, but a really important one. And certainly depending on when and where, you'll have walls being built by farmers, tenant farmers, um, and certainly earlier uh, in the 18th century, uh, enslaved or indentured individuals, um, and later free uh, black or indigenous people. So if you're able to find a first-hand account, that's really lucky, and uh, really adds to our uh, understanding of how uh, our land is being used and built upon during this time. <coughs> So maps uh, of varying types, like I was saying earlier, are a great, another great source of information. Um, and this one was actually recommended to me uh, by the state archaeologist in Rhode Island. Um, this actually represents a portion of Middletown. This was actually a federal survey that was being done. But what he pointed out to me and that I was surprised by is every dotted line on that map indicates a stone wall. So there are maps like this that you can access. 
that can show you similar information, I'm sure. Excuse me, about Sichuan. And New England farmers had divided and fenced their land under the presumption that that was the best way to grow things, that that's going to give the best uh, yield of crop. But, da, da, da. <laughs> stone walls were in fact one of the reasons that agriculture declined in New England. Um, in 1850, there were about 168 small family farms in New England and New York, and about 75 to 80% of the region had already been cleared and farmed. So those regions, our region's small fields, were adequate enough for subsistence farming, for family farming, for generations. But by the Industrial Revolution, those small walled fields couldn't keep up with the amount of production that was happening in the Midwest, which was just completely open. They also couldn't accommodate a lot of new inventions, like mechanized equipment, that just didn't fit within um, efficiently harvesting crops within those boundaries. So that's one of the reasons there was a decline in dry stone wall building by the mid-19th century. But despite that decline, uh, Stonewall building uh, continued through the 19th century. It's uh, evolving more into uh, sort of industrial walls related to bridges, related to lots of urban development, and also estate walls. Um, and of course, estate walls are primarily serving an aesthetic function, but it's also really uh, interesting to think about the uh, immigrant labor and skills that were brought from Europe to build those walls. We see a lot of complexity uh, and uh, particularly in masonry. So these are often um, used non-local stone and uh, were mortared together. So those traditions were being brought here and uh, explored uh, throughout New England. So I've included a photo here from the Eustis Estate, uh, which if you've ever been to Eustis Estate, uh, it's a gorgeous um, property, beautiful to walk around, uh, but definitely representative of the idea of, you know, Boston's um, wealthy elite trying to escape the ills of the, of the city and uh, retreating into the country. And um, with that brought prolific wall building in that area as well. So at the Eustis Estate, there's a lot of use actually of local uh, fieldstone and materials, uh, both for buildings and walls. Um, the estate was actually built on agricultural land, um, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Eustis maintained uh, a small gentleman's farm with livestock, <coughs> hay fields, and an ice pond. So continuing in agricultural use um, and using natural stone, but in much different contexts. So at the turn of the 20th century, so this is really influenced by the bicentennial, stone walls started to become uh, in, uh, imbued in our idea of what New England is in a romantic sense, capital R romantic sense. And um, they kind of evoked a, a simpler time, as they often do to us today. Um, and uh, you can see this type of romanticism, if you will. This is one of our houses in Newberry, Mass, uh, the Dole Little House. And um, initially it had a wood fence, that's a 19th century photo, but by the 1950s it had a stone wall. So it's sort of this evolution of this is what a colonial house should look like. It should have a stone wall. Um, and I became very curious when I heard about situations about the old bucket old house. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking of romanticism and this idea of you know tourist attractions that were colonial uh, in nature. And I couldn't find a better image than this to show this is what a tourist in the 19th century would expect to find at the old old, old open bucket house: uh, a stone wall with a beautiful uh, preserved landscape. So as uh, Stonewall building evolved in New England, um, I included this as a really stark example, because this is the Grovius House in Lincoln, Massachusetts, if you've ever been. 
Um, it is a super modern house. It was built in the 1930s by Walter Gropius, who came from uh, Germany. He was the founder of the Bauhaus. Um, and so he was full on capital M modernism. But interestingly, when he came to New England, he wanted to use vernacular and um, local materials and building techniques. So it may not look like it's the house is very modern, but he wanted to use the existing agricultural stone walls and in fact took some of them apart to create retaining walls as part of his design, which you can see here. So he's using the stone walls to evoke New England um, and also then trying to create this conversation between his modern house and then the historic site that he built upon. So stone walls, they once served a functional purpose, but today they're uh, threads to our landscape. And um, as I was kind of alluding to, they're really imbued with people and um, who built them and provide context to how our land uh, developed over time. Uh, they withstood lots of development pressure, they still do. Um, they survived harsh New England winters, and I think oftentimes, and I'm sure you can attest to this too, being interested in preservation, that they're often taken for granted. They're kind of like the last thing people think of. They might think of a building first and then a stone wall. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now in the second part here about how stone walls actually are protected in a legal sense, and then what can be done in terms of educating people. So we know these threats to stone walls, right? We know that um, they're very vulnerable to uh, human forces as well as natural forces. So a lot of our walls are overgrown and covered with vegetation. Um, they are often damaged by vehicles or plows. And um, they're often open to theft. One of the things that drives me crazy is just people driving by and taking the capstones away. So um, their locations are often viewed as public, which is one of the reasons why they're perceived as an open source of, of uh, material. So there's uh, state legislation in three New England states um, that has varying degrees of efficacy. In Massachusetts, stone walls are protected technically under the law, but as you can see, if you just breeze through this, the penalty is only $10. So I don't think that that really uh, inhibits or prevents uh, protection of the wall, but technically it is on the books. In Rhode Island, more recently, uh, this woman, Leona Kelly, was a major advocate for stone walls. Uh, they actually passed legislation um, that actual convicted defendants have to pay restitution at the discretion of the judge. So that has a little more teeth to it. Um, and I'm interested to kind of follow, because uh, I'm a nerd that way, <laughs> but follow the case law with this. Who has actually been charged and, and what were their fines? And then finally, New Hampshire is the third state that actually has protection. They're only protected if they're part of a state scenic road, which leads me to another way to protect walls in Massachusetts, which is at the local level. So if you have a designated scenic road, I know I saw one coming in as I was driving in. If your town designates a scenic road, the walls along that scenic road um, are protected by local planning authorities. So if there were, change, there were changes proposed for the wall, they have to be approved by the local planning board. Um, and this is the list, I hope it's accurate, the list that I found on the town's website of all the scenic roads in situate. I'm sure there are many more that can be designated. Uh, but that's just uh, an interesting way to get to approach protecting stone walls. And this document here is another great resource. It was developed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, provides a lot of guidance on, on scenic roads and their protection. Another way is through local historic districts. Stone walls can be considered part of the built environment, so changes to them um, can be monitored by um, a local historic district commission. 
Um, here I included the Old Kings Highway Historic District, it's one of the biggest in Massachusetts. It goes through five towns along the Cape. And this is one of our easement properties on the Cape that has stone walls, which are both protected by us and through uh, local, local ordinance. And finally, one of the more specific ways uh, a stone wall can be protected, but one that I champion since I, I do it every day, is through a preservation easement. So that's a protection for a specific property. Uh, it's a deed restriction. And um, Historic New England uh, protects this farm. I included it because it has adorable animals. Um, in Sutton, Massachusetts. So we protect 53 acres at this site. It's privately owned, but the stone walls are um, part of that protection. Not if there's a house, there's a cemetery, and the land is also protected from subdivision. So it's a nice package. But there are other ways, other, and I always say this for, for a lot of different um, preservation questions, there are ways to protect things other than just laws and legislation, and a lot of that has to do with educating people about why a particular resource is important. Certainly the historic society is a major part of that. Um, but I've also, I'd also like to point out specifically uh, the bullets that are kind of toward the middle, uh, particularly the Stone Trust in Vermont, um, which you'll see in a minute. I got to do a workshop there. They are leaders in training people uh, in the art of dry stone wall building, and uh, they're very close to us. So if you're interested in learning how to build a wall, I would suggest starting there, because they are fantastic. Um, the Yukon Stone Wall Initiative, if you're familiar with Robert Thorson, some people have read his book about stone walls, I would highly recommend it. Um, and his website kind of provides you some great context and history of stone walls. And finally, documentation is another great way to consider preservation from another angle. Um, I would say that New Hampshire is a leader in this um, because they have been collecting data <coughs> through LIDAR, which is very sophisticated. It is a, uh, a technology that can track um, the topography of land um, through lasers. It stands for light detection and ranging. And basically, it can detect such minute differences in topography that it can actually pull out where it thinks there are stone walls, even if there's tree cover and brush cover. I mean, LIDAR can detect uh, things like cart paths and things that are no longer visible to the naked eye. Um, so, what's happening in New Hampshire is researchers are actually inventorying these walls on the ground. You can see a little box popped up. Somebody said, hey, I found this wall, and it matches what LIDAR says. So they're actually tracking their stone walls in that way, which is just so interesting to me. Now you might recognize somebody in that picture. It's a little dusty. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the part of the presentation where I just briefly go over how is a wall held together and how is it constructed. And um, this photo was taken while I was working as part of the Equinix Stone Wall Initiative. Um, we uh, uh, were part of two nonprofits that were trying to train volunteers how to rebuild and preserve stone walls in the island where uh, Newport, Middletown, and Portsmouth are in Rhode Island. And we were able to attend a workshop, a one day workshop, at the Stone Trust in Vermont. So the Stone Trust uses um, information from the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain. So if you go to their website, it'll give you a great outline. Uh, and they have five principles, which I'll kind of outline, which uh, guide people in how to build a sturdy stone wall. So most walls you come across are going to fit into one of three categories. They're going to be a stone pile, which is just stones uh, kind of tossed to the side and get them out of the way. A single stack, which is a little more sophisticated, maybe taking a little more time to take that pile and make it into uh, a wall. And then a double wall, which is the most sophisticated. Um, and stone piles are typically found further out in the field where the stones have to just be quickly moved away, but double walls are found closer into the farmstead, so kind of near the farm yard and farmhouse. So here's a uh, photograph of a double wall. Um, 
The reason I'm sharing double walls in particular is because it's a great way to understand how things are held, uh, how to get them held together and how they're constructed. It's just a very uh, methodical approach. So here are the five rules outlined uh, by the Stonewall Association of Great Britain. And of course, our early wall builders uh, would have brought stone, uh, not stone building knowledge with them uh, when they came to America. Uh, it's also important to remember, and people often ask, these are all dry laid. They are able to flex and move with the earth. It's, you don't see it. But the reason they stay together is because they're built in such a way that when frost uh, heave happens, when there's freeze thaw cycles, they actually are able to flex and move very gently uh, with the landscape.
And since we're working with the regularly shaped stones, these are just round stones, not ones that have been cut to fit. Um, there's a lot of nuance there and a lot of artistry to be able to decipher where do I put the stone and how does it quite work in the design that I'm, I'm creating. Um, when you're working with a regular stone, you should strive for three points of contact. Um, so it takes a lot of tweaking and a lot of uh, moving of the stone to make those points of contact. And often smaller stones, called pinning stones, are used to kind of lock that larger stone in place, the one that's on the face of the wall. Once all the stones are pinned in, then you can add harding to it before you start the next layer. So the harding are gathered, the small stones that are in the center of the wall to give it some extra stability. So in a taller wall, the above three feet, yes, they did make me lift above my head. And that, that's what I said. I needed some time of all at the end of that day because it was a lot of hard work. But um, at three feet or higher, it's recommended to use a through stone, which again provides some added stability. So that's a stone that goes all the way through. You can see it's a thin stone that kind of, you wouldn't see it from the outside, but it really does uh, run through both sides of the wall. Kind of prevents it from bellying out, if that makes sense. So in addition to providing a finished look to the wall, uh, capstones are used um, to, um, in a similar way to a through stone. Um, they're usually large and flat and placed closely together, um, and they provide protection to the interior of the wall. And on some walls, you may find what are called cope stones, which are the stones that are sticking up kind of like books on a shelf there. Um, this is a way to make a uh, wall higher or more quickly than adding more forces. It's also, um, and I've heard this in various anecdotes, um, apparently some animals may be put off like goats, although goats aren't really put off by many things, but. Um, <laughs> Maybe a way to prevent some animals from attempting to jump because that surface just looks too uneven to them. So um, it's it's one way that it, it's believed that uh, animals were uh, prevented from trying to jump over the wall. So here's one of the projects that was completed um, at the time that I was part of this project. Uh, this was a retaining wall along the street. So um, in this last part of the um, of the presentation, I'm just going to go over a few things you should think of if you're if you're approaching a repair. What are the concepts and um, kind of background you should be thinking as you're making uh, decisions about repair? So there's lots of different factors to take into consideration. Um, and we're going to take a look at these few factors uh, quickly in the next few slides. But uh, most importantly, when you look at your local walls, uh, you're going to observe characteristics that are really uh, hyper-local to your own community. So identifying those is really important. And that's what a lot of uh, repair is all about, whether it's materials or your construction methods. Um, it's really identifying how, uh, how walls were built in particular time and place. And it's often not an all or nothing cast. A lot of times you'll see walls like the one you see here. This is at Casey Farm in Rhode Island. The wall just collapsed in that one area. You can just take apart that section and angle it back in. It's not an all or nothing. Like I need to take out the whole wall and rebuild it. Um, it was really just that section that needed some, some TLC. So um, from I like to think of this as kind of the philosophy of repair, because there's three different kinds of walls that are shown here. These wild walls that we're really familiar with, the ones that are in the woods, um, kind of historical walls, ones that are a little bit more well-formed, uh, maybe they surround a churchyard or other cultural sites, and of course, a, a more elaborate state, a state wall, one that has um, borders together and it's using non-local stone. So for the, the second two, it's easy to see how repair is a strategy. For the wild walls, I often think of them, and, and this is, of course, you know, a matter of debate, but they're almost like a, you would consider an ancient ruin, something that you try not to recreate or rebuild. Um, they could be rebuilt, certainly, but um, I think it's worthwhile to take some thought into them as ruins, as these untouched 
uh, features of the landscape. Again, looking at the construction of the wall is really important before you start, um, whether it's a stone pile or a single stack, but you also see even more local variations. I included the lace walls that you see at the bottom. Those are from Martha's Vineyard, um, and they've been identified by um, many stone wall building experts. Um, they have a transparency to them, I guess you can say, that makes them look delicate, just the way the stones are placed with little gaps between them, which is why they're called lace walls. But identifying those different, slightly different characteristics by really taking a careful look is, is an important part of repair. Now I included these two walls because um, although they're not native to New England, they show the range of, of Stonewall building. These are taken um, from the Stonewall Trust in Dumerson, Vermont. Um, they built an Irish family wall and a Scottish Galloway wall. Um, you can see how the Irish family wall almost has a double coke stone at the top. So it starts as a double wall and morphs into like this double, double coke stone at the top. Um, with those large slabs on the ends, which you can see around here, um, like entrances to farmyards or farms. In the Scottish Galloway wall, that's a double wall with a single wall on the top. So if you were trying to recreate that or, or approach it, you'd really want to uh, decipher it, uh, take it apart and think about uh, the different uh, elements of walls. You can have walls that are even made of two different types of construction. And of course, the types of stone are important. Um, and this is a question that we often get in terms of, uh, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to so source local stone to make repairs if it's been taken away. So it's important to find stone that at least, if not geologically perfect, um, matches in some way the stone that's uh, local to your community, whether that's color or shape or size. And you can see all the different uh, variations here. And finally, the question of mortar, which people are very eager, it it's, um, seems more secure uh, to want to add maybe uh, mortar to the center of a wall. Maybe that'll hold it together better. Or maybe add it um, to coke stones or capstones to try to prevent people from taking them. What I have seen are, are well-intended you know, interventions, but that eventually fail because the wall itself and its dry leg wasn't intended uh, to have parts that were hard and stuck in place. It was intended to flex. So eventually those parts that are held in place uh, will start to break away because they're harder and uh, more tight in than the, the surrounding stone. Um, if there is, however, um, more a mortar wall, like an estate wall, you'd want to look at the type of stone that it's made out of. You'd want to match basically the porosity of the stone. So if it's like a sandstone, you need to use a soft lime mortar. If you start to use things like Portland cement, um, that, that doesn't match the, the stone type, that can really cause some damage. And of course, we all know that regular maintenance is an important part of uh, what we do as preservationists. So uh, for historic sites, we often recommend doing just an annual inspection, um, resetting just those few stones, it, it happens quickly, but resetting those few stones that may have fallen throughout the year. Um, of course, removing leaves and debris, which of course can be very helpful with this. Is, I took this at one of our Eastern properties where after a year I was shocked the amount of vegetation these goats had cleared away just doing them. Uh, so very clever ways to try to get rid of that vegetation that stuck around the walls. Um, and of course, building volunteer opportunities is a great way to, to encourage appreciation of walls in the community. So, um, in preservation, we often say there's no one-size-fits-all solution, and I think I've touched upon this in, um, throughout the presentation. Um, but uh, I'd like to leave you with this quote by Dan Snow, who's a dry stone wall artist, uh, he wrote a book that you can probably get from the local library too. Um, and he said, uh, we need to do all we can to preserve walls, but it's not necessary that they remain in some state of amber exactly as they were a thousand years ago. 
or a hundred years ago, or even yesterday. Preservation is part of the continuum of the craft, which includes restoration. There are good reasons to repair and rebuild historical works. And I really believe that, that it's not just, a, in this case in particular, it's not just about physically fixing things, it's actually training new people how to do it. That's actually part of this intangible um, element of preservation that's so important too. So thank you very much. I hope you learned something. I've been told that mortared stone walls only came into vogue in the late 19th, early 20th century. Is that correct? I would say so, yes. Um, and I think it's very much tied to um, kind of the, I should do estate walls, but during that kind of industrial time of building. I mean, there were certainly stone buildings being built in colonial America, and there's probably some examples of mortared walls that are with bigger like, uh, estates. I'm thinking places like Mount Vernon, for example. But for a, a farm, it would be very unlikely that it would be all dry weight stone. Yeah. Yes? Is there a way, as we're walking through the woods and contemplating all these miles of stone walls, is there a way that we can interpret the walls determine whether they're a boundary wall versus a wall that was built to keep animals in place. Uh, as far as structure, I know mean, you've gone through you know, structural things, but as you're walking along, of course, some of these are in disrepair, but um, when you talk about, say, the height of the uh, wall, to me, I would interpret that as something that's going to keep an animal in versus mm -hmm. something that's a boundary wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also other artifacts that kind of go along in these spaces where you'll see a pile of rocks, mm -hmm. which to me would kind of indicate either a clearing of a field. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, in general, um, interpreting walls as far as their width and their height, um, meaning about walls to keep animals in, that they, they need to be, um, actually, some of them are buried deeper in the soil to yep. keep pigs from digging under them, mm -hmm. are wide enough so a bull can't push them over, and tall enough so that a horse can't jump over it, or whatever. Right. So, you know, when I walk through the, the, um, the woods, and I'm trying to kind of interpret walls, particularly when they come together from other places, I'm trying to figure out, was that a penned area, or was that a, a boundary line? Is there a general... Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to think of the amount of stone that's probably there. Like a boundary line is probably not going to be as intense as an agricultural wall meant to contain. So I do think that's one way to look at it. I also think because of the way walls have been sort of covered up and grown around, it's, I think it's really important to try to find 
some way to look at the primary source documents, try to match up. Does this wall kind of correlate with a farm, a farm site? Um, I think using earlier maps is, is probably one of the best ways to go about that. I would also recommend taking a look, um, if you're really interested in, in deciphering wall types, um, that book I mentioned by Robert Thorson, if you haven't looked at it. Um, What's his last name? Thorson, T-H-O-R-S-O-N. Actually, I did make a resource slide. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some ideas there for further, further research. But he's done like, so much research about Stonewalls in New England and has, he writes in a way that does help you parse out a little bit some of those questions. It, it does take a little guesswork, but if you want an exact kind of answer, I think going back to primary sources is the best way. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, sorry, one more question. Yeah. I'll send my wife asked for evidence to actually live with electron stone form. Okay. Uh, but, uh, anyways, um, down in uh, Middletown, Rhode Island, those uh, real flat stones, they almost look like slate. Those are really interesting. I don't think that they're all, uh, I don't think they're granite. I think, uh, I should have clarified that a little. They're a hard stone, they're kind of like slate, but they're, I can't remember if they're a schist or some other kind of hard stone. Um, Newport, as I researched, has its own hyper-specific geology of a lot of melting things going on. Um, and so that's why their stone looks so different. It is very thin and slabby. It's hard, but it's thin and slabby. So. Thank you. 